Hello? Mac, what happened there? We tried to go live and it was like, it's stuck. Mate, I'm frozen. Are you frozen? You're not, no. You're not frozen ah, mine. It was on my screen. <laughs> I think I think the, the angels above are actually, they're against us tonight. Um, oh. I just literally, like, I hit the button to go live and the, for the intro to start and it didn't start. So I was like, what the hell? I pressed it again. Then it started and then it came off. And I was like, you know that way where it's like with a shirt and shower curtain comes in and you're like naked <laughs> as hell. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> press it again, press it again. We're just kinda, uh, so we the, just the showed up the screen. I was like, hi. <laughs> you were like mid golf. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, I didn't even finish that golf. I'll do it now. I'll do it now. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody to the tonight's Sunday show. Um Totally looking forward to this one. I'll be looking forward to this one in a few weeks. There's sometimes we're part of all the groups and whatnot, <clears> being film, being aspiring filmmakers ourselves. So we always kind of keep an eye on what's going on locally. And a, a movie I had keep I kept seeing circulating through groups and people saying, "Check this out!" was a movie called Mercy Falls. So as in great fashion, I'm always like, "Yeah, we've got a podcast. Come on!" And um. <laughs> And I was even able to to get a run, which is still going now at BathgateCinema.co.uk. Get your tickets. You can come and see Mercy Falls at Bathgate Cinema. And you should, because you should support Independent. And it's pretty good. So you would want to come along and see it. So head to BathgateCinema.co.uk. Book your tickets. Come in and see it. And you might even see me there. And I'll proper give you a coffee and all that stuff. Um, so I tonight we're chatting to Ryan Hendrick, who is the... the uh, oh, well, I, I assume he's the, the brain master behind this. There's usually the brain, that one person. The brain master. The brain ma Aye. Is that a thing? <laughs> Isn't that? Um, why is that funny? That's not even funny. I think you mean mastermind or brain master. It's the same thing. <laughs> Isn't it? Mastermind. What's in the mind? The brain. It's the same thing. Let's go with it's going that. on a t-shirt, isn't it? It's going on a t-shirt, isn't it? I'm the brain master. It sounds like a horror film. Page master, brain master, mastermind. Mastermind sounds like a horror film. Um, aye, so tonight we're going to chat with uh, Ryan, and you guys can also do that too in the comments. So just punt one of your comments in the comments, and we'll bring it up, and we can ask Ryan, have you ever wanted to be a filmmaker? Have you ever w wondered what it's like to make a film or to make a film independently without the big honchos giving you all the budget and whatnot? Um, so I definitely stick with us for the next hour or so, and we will... We'll talk about Mercy Falls, but before we bring Ryan on, here's the trailer. The trailer for Mercy Falls. A hitchhiker. Good morning, campers. We're heading off in search for Rona's lost cabin. Seems like a treasure hunt. You should come be our guide. Heather. What? To find a treasure. To find a treasure. <laughs> Falls. Have you ever heard of the Siren of the Loch? I'm going to go take a dip in the lagoon. The lost hikers look to the water for solace. It comes from beneath the surface. They look for those teetering on the edge. Are you kidding? Rona, what? Oh, wait. Where is he? I warned you, arsehole. <laughs> we need to stop the bleeding. Do something! Be okay. You killed him. We're accomplices. These are the wildlands, love. And now what? We find the cabin. We go our separate ways. Find us this morning at the Berlanic Psychiatric Hospital. We need to get out of here. We go to the cabin. <laughs> 
God, please. You don't even know what it is. I think I can get it. We know she's coming. We know she'll find us. I don't know what to do. We stop her. Ryan, welcome to the show. That trailer looks... I mean, it's pretty much what got me into wanting to see it. Which awesome. is the point of the trailer, right? <laughs> you, you think, well, yeah, yeah, hopefully it gets people in. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks very much for having me on. Uh, it's always no, good to get a, get a new uh, nickname. Brain Master is going to stick. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan the Brain Master. Uh, <clears throat> God. It sounds, it's got a ring to it. I've been known to give people nicknames that stick, like um, J Mac. His name's actually um, Jordan Aitken McGeg. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. My, name... <laughs> my name's my name's Jordan McGeg. See, what happened was right. My wife, when we got married, double barreled her name to keep her surname in there somewhere. So Kevin just <laughs> calls me that to piss me off. But it's fine. It's all in it's all in good fun. Some time to time, we're known to have a wee a wee giggle <clears throat> between each other. So Ryan, we are aspiring filmmakers. We've made a couple of short films um and we've loved film for our whole entire life, which is kind of what brought this podcast together. Um mm. for you, like before we talk about Mercy Falls, like where was the moment you were like I think I want to give this filmmaking a try. Like, what 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 inspired you growing up? What were your favourite films? I know that's quite a loaded thing there, but yeah, well, um, pretty much. Um, I saw a lot of film, a lot of TV when I was a kid. Uh, like, you know, my dad's a big film enthusiast, so you know, loads of stuff uh, all the time. Whether it was like the old Bond films, or it was like uh, old reruns of Doctor Who, uh, <laughs> and it kind of just got my imagination going at a really young age, and. I remember kind of writing like one little one page script to Doctor Who, you know, like at eight years old, that kind of thing. Just then, just, mm -hmm. you know, just the whole thing of telling stories and then doing like kind of little performances in school and all that kind of thing. And then um, we had uh, my aunt, um, who's a set designer, who was our production designer on Mercy Falls, mm -hmm. uh, married a uh, actor director uh, who basically kind of just turned around and said, You just got to get out there and start, you just got to go make something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure he was very popular with my parents because at that point I was like, okay, I need a, I need a camcorder. Uh, so I badgered my parents for a while to get a, a, wee, a wee camcorder and they finally got me one, one of those wee high eight jobs. And mm. uh, that, that was the start of it. Um, and yeah, just we, uh, we were just, uh, I, got, I used to cast my uncles uh, on the weekend to come out and, you know, in their best suits and run around the woods with. <laughs> fake guns and get all manky uh, <laughs> and it, it all just kind of grew out from there and then I remember um, an assembly in school um, some get, they announced there were um, the three different the three different high schools in, in the in the area were teaming up to do a video with the police and uh, GMAC or what was used to be known as uh, GFEW um, mm. to do this project about anti-vandalism and they wanted volunteers and so I went straight right into the careers officer that was organising it. I was like, "Yeah, that that that's me." And I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't the guy that that volunteered or put myself up for many things, you know, because um, yeah, I, you know, I remember like um, when I first went to high school, I went they, my parents and their in divine wisdom sent me to St Aloysius, which was a terrible idea. Um, and when I moved, uh, I moved. You take expand on that one. You take expand oh, on that one. <laughs> And uh, you know, just uh, if you if you're if you're not going to be a doctor or a lawyer, or your parents don't come from money, uh, you will be hated. <laughs> it's right. probably the best, the least, the best, most I can say without getting <laughs> someone else into a lot of trouble. Uh, but <clears throat> when I moved, I think halfway through second year, it was decided this was not for me. Uh, so they moved me, and I chose to go to Douglas Academy in Mogai because I grew up in Burst Um and. I kind of went there, and it was that kind of thing where they, they, they went, "Oh, it's a posh boy from from alleys," you know. No, no, they, they, they kind of they, they labelled me incorrectly, but they thought 
you must be good at rugby. Join the A team. And I was like, oh. and, I was like and you, you know, that was just kind of overwhelmed at that age. I was like, oh, Christ, here we go. So it kind of threw me into this rug, the game of rugby. And, you know, I was shit at rugby. Um, <laughs> so it was embarrassing. I never lived it down for about a year. Um, the Ali's kid that was uh, that was shite at rugby. So, yeah, I get I demoted. I get kicked out of the rugby team on the first day. Um, so I, I never put myself up for stuff. And it was always sports-related stuff you in school. You know what I mean? So... Um, eventually, this came around, and it was like, okay, I want, I want, I want this. Um, and they, 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 you know, they, they sent me to go do that, and that was when the world opened. Because then you, then I found out, you know, there's a, there's a community, there's an industry, um, and you know, then you've got access to kit and editing facilities, and you start to, you, just, you know, that way when you kind of meet someone who's further up the food chain than you are, you kind of just soak up all their experience as much as you can you learn as much as you can from people uh, yeah. and I just love being around other filmmakers um, mm. just um, just talking about ideas and just kind of you know you're just surrounded by people that kind of think on the same kind of wavelength as you and that really is kind of what, what kind of in, drives you to kind of make stuff yeah. mm. we've kind of been in similar situations because when you're young you tend to look at people you see on TV or in film as like unreal like they don't exist mm. until then you're sat with them in a room and i remember we were chatting to our friend Stephen mccall and i said to him about having a bit about imposter syndrome where i was at like a big meeting with a lot of big executives and different distribution companies and i said i says i kind of felt like i snuck through the back door and was just like mingling with all these people that i shouldn't have been and he goes mate he says in this industry, there is no front door. We all came in that same back door. And I was like, that's brilliant. That is such wisdom, right? Well, you know, he's, he's bang on. I mean, I think everyone, no matter how long you've been doing it, it is, whenever they're in one of those situations, everyone in the room is quietly shouting themselves because they're waiting to be found out. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think imposter syndrome is was born in the film industry. Um, <laughs> and it was just, uh, everyone's got it. And I, I get yeah. it as well. I mean, um, at the first the first couple of days of a, of a film shoot, um, I've, I get it really bad because you turn up and mm. you know, like, like this film and the last film lost for Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. I just found that you got people are day one in particular people are staring at you and it could, and, it, and it goes right through you you're thinking oh my god all these people that you don't know that have that have been hired by somebody else who that um, that trusts you and it's kind of the, all these new people have been brought on and they're waiting they're looking at me to see if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then you know you feel you're being judged, and then about day two or three, at some point you go, you kind of realise it turns into actually they're just waiting to be told what to do. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're not. Um, so it's it's just it's overcoming that little fear, um, and it's always there because you just like you start. Um, I was saying to someone the other night, um, at Q and A, it was like, what are you going to do next? And it's like, well, here's the thing: uh, every time you do a film, you finish it, you put it out there. And then you literally hit the reset button and you've got to start all over again from nothing and build mm -hmm. it up. So again, that fear of failure and uh, is really contributes to that, that whole imposter syndrome. Um, mm. So yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just part, it's an occupational hazard. You're, you're going to, you're going to meet it at some point in your career, whether you want to or not. Yeah. We, um, we done your... a production. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just going to say basically, um, we done a production and the most used word that we kind of came across together as a team was ah it's a learning curve we said that about absolutely everything i take it learning curves are no just to the newbies like j mac and myself oh christ no uh, i mean yeah um if if you don't learn something every single day then there's no point uh, you, you might as well give up and go do something else um yeah every single time i mean i was like at a screen of the film last night um, in Helmsborough, and it was, um, it must have been like my eighth viewing in the last three weeks on a, on a cinema screen, uh, and I was getting a bit bored of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> but but I've got past that point of being fed up with it to the point where I'm starting to see mistakes in it. I'm starting to see how I could have done things differently. Right. And I'm thinking, okay, hope no one's seen that. That's all right. Um, and you start you start kind of thinking about how you might have changed things. But and it's like, but some of these mistakes weren't, or not mistakes, some of these changes or how you do it different um mm -hmm. weren't obvious to me three weeks ago mm -hmm. and it's just like but you know how many how many, uh, how many people watch this that that are going to watch every film they watch 
dozens of times. They don't. Um, mm. So it's like the, what people what people see on a viewing is not necessarily what I see because it comes with all the baggage and the memories of mm. of being there and doing it and putting it together. But um, yeah, you're always you're, you are always learning, and you should always be wanting to kind of improve and just look for things that you think you could you could do better next time. Yeah, um, I'm glad. I suppose no, nobody nobody can criticize you worse than yourself. You know. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. You are your own worst critic. Yeah. Always. What were you going to say, J Mac? Um, I think it was uh, uh, the learning curve thing. I mean, the what what was you, what's your history? Did you did you go to film school and stuff, or did, no. does, did you just start just like I'm gung ho? Let's just go make a film. Yeah. Um. I mean, I I remember uh, always wanting to go to the New York Film School. Uh. But you know, I, didn't, I couldn't afford to go. Um. And it was that kind of advice of just going to get on and try something. So. I kind of got a taste for it once I kind of dived in and mm -hmm. you just kind of, again, you make it, I mean, the, the first thing I made when I was like 15, 16 years old, you know, it was awful. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, no understanding of a, or, or, of a white balance or, you know, or the dreaded crossing of the line. None of that was uh, made, <laughs> was, uh, was in my brain at all, but it's just, you just, you just got to get out. And if you get a taste for doing it, you kind of, you, you, you do it and you look back at it and then you kind of just keep going um, and you try again. You try, you're always trying to make the next one better than the last. Mm -hmm. And I started off, um, uh, the only training that I really had was uh, as an actor, but that happened after I made a couple of films. I was just mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I remember going to college after school. And, um, what was it? Uh, went to Motherwell College for, um, what, what I thought was um, TV operations, which are meant to be very hands-on and very practical. But between me applying, getting accepted, and the summer holidays rolling around the start, and they turned it into film craft and animation, uh, <laughs> which basically meant it was all theory-based or it was um, animation-based. I had no interest in Lennon Flash. <laughs> uh, they had one bit on... They had a little brief introduction to film editing uh, on you know, a really old version of the premiere. But Again, I've made a couple of films, so I'd already uh, taught myself uh, through um, sort of volunteering at GMAC um, on how to edit on like the old tape machines or the old, um, or, or even on Avid. So it kind of it was just like I was just playing the bit around with what I already knew. It was just like I'm learning nothing here, so I left mm -hmm. that, um, <laughs> and then just I made a film and then worked for a bit, and eventually uh, I was I was a, I was a hotel manager. At the Kirk House Inn in Strathblane, uh, and uh, eventually, <laughs> I just woke up one day and, and thought, "This is not going the way I wanted to go. What do I, what am I going to do? And do you know what I need to do? I need to quit. Suddenly, just quit my job out of the blue, and think about it." So I randomly <laughs> just walked out my job one day uh, and sat around wow. uh, for a couple of weeks whilst my parents were on holiday, just trying to figure <laughs> it out. And then I decided, in my infinite wisdom, that uh, what I should do is become an actor. Uh, because I, you know, I was dabbling in that as well, and I figured I would learn more about how to deal with actors if I trained as one. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I was very wet around the ears, didn't know any anything about how to do that, go about doing that. I went, okay, where can I study acting? Mm, okay, I know of two places: the RSMD and Stowe College, because my cousin just did a drama course there. You know what? They're quite close together. I'll go into town and I'll go and apply. So I just marched into these places completely wet. Said, how do you apply? Um, and I'd, you know, it was so it was in the bloody summer, so I'd missed uh, auditioning <laughs> for the RSAMD, and I barely managed to <clears throat> get in an application form with days to spare for Stowe College and got in. Um, so that was it. I just kind of didn't look back. Just kind of, oh, oh well, let's see if that works. Uh, very, very naive, but I just kind of that kind of got up and go. Um, That's what works. That's yes. exactly how it works. That scares the <laughs> shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. it's shame you thinking about it now. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, Janice says, "We're watching. Sorry, we're at the grocery store right now watching y'all. That's all it is. <laughs> y'all make me feel old. I hope you're buying tomatoes." Uh, Matthewman <laughs> says, "Saw the movie the other night. As a horror fan, I was pleasantly surprised with how the movie played out. Great we watch." And he Thanks also so says, much. "A fellow Motherwell College guy. <laughs> ah, by the way, Matthewman is one hell of a talent." He does a lot of our graphics and for other people as well, but I'll need to show you some of his works. Um, so maybe it's a Motherwell College guy. I don't think Matthewman actually studied learning Photoshop. He just was came at the womb 
holding a mouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, what are what are some of your fa- like J Mac and I talk at length on the show about the films that got us into film, the film that made us like feel. What are like some of your top five favorite films? This is how we judge people. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like when you you get your girlfriend, you walk, you, you kind of, you kind of, you check out the DVD collection, and you figure if you're going to get on or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh, I, do, I, I was actually asked this last night, and I, I kind of went, "Oh my god, what an awful question." Um, I think, <laughs> you know, but uh, I, I, I always, I always come back to Heat. I think Heat is an incredible film. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Michael Mann film from the, uh, the mid nineties. Um, yeah. It's just, it's a. Uh, it's it's probably one of the closest to a perfect film I've ever seen. That is a couple of uh, others as well, but um, the other one that I've always you know, planes, trains, and automobiles, and local hero are big favourites um, mm-hmm. that have had a big influence on me. And a bit of an un- unknown one is um, Christopher Nolan's third film, Insomnia, which no one ever mm. talks about. They always talk about yeah. Memento, they talk about Batman, Inception, etc., but. They never talk about insomnia. Al Pacino and Robin Williams and Hilary Swank, three Oscar winners in the mm. cast. Uh, it's an exceptional film. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, 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 enough, I think I, I learned more from the director's commentary on that movie than I have anywhere mm. else. Um, <laughs> just kind of everything making sense and just kind of soaking up uh, kind of all, all the kind of little tips and hints and Mm. How thing how approaches are made to different scenes and how they shot it. You're a J Mac movie type of guy. He likes yeah. the same kind of stuff as you. Yeah, um, I'm a bit more off to the side, like Never Ending Story and <laughs> Labyrinth. Yeah, <laughs> I love I love them as well. I love them as well. Totally. But I, I like to I'll, I'll dip my toe into like Danish cinema and stuff, and uh, I'll, I'll kind of I'll, I'll stray away from the the normal kind of things that most people kind of get brought up watching. Um, mm-hmm. but uh, the you just you mentioned the directors the director's commentary on insomnia. I think it's one of the good things about physical media is they can mm-hmm. they can actually be a wealth of information about mm-hmm. how to go about making a film. Like once you once you get past just looking at on set photos and different trailers for different countries, director's commentaries are amazing. Um, oh, absolutely, I love commentaries. I love the. I love like uh, long documentaries about the making of films, like um, Dangerous Days, the making of Blade Runner. It's like a three-hour long mm. documentary, mm. Uh, which is just stunning to watch. Uh, soak all that stuff up because um, you're just oh. learning about thought process and how things come together, and uh, you know it kind of informs you later on and how, how to gives you ideas about how to approach things. And it's just yeah, it's our guest next week are. Uh... The creators of RoboDoc. They also made it, the uh, Pennywise, the story of it. And um, those mm. guys are Dead Mouse Productions, um, good friends of ours. And I can highly recommend to you all their stuff is basically in depth looks at all their favorite films from stuff like Fright Night, You're So Cool, Brewster. Um, they do great physical media for that as well but if you love documentaries that go right in and then i would say this was like a their movies uh, their documentaries are autopsies on films <laughs> oh, right? okay. almost right. forensic level documentaries right. on how films so are made. good love so it. good I'll, I'll need to put you it's funny on though one of, one of the one of the reviews for the pennywise documentary they made it was about the 1990 miniseries um mm. and uh, one of the amazon reviews said hmm it's only really good if you're really into it it's like, well, fucking I. <laughs> <laughs> it's a three-hour-long documentary about it. You're going to have to be into it to enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah. What? Who do you think it's for? You know? <laughs> just no seeing its market. <laughs> um, so where, where, did, where did you conceptualise Mercy Falls? I love, uh, J-Mac and myself, we do like a great Scottish film. We love mm. a great Scottish film set in cabins or set in the woods on their way to cabins stuff like that i mean i when i started watching mercy falls i did get a feeling of an american werewolf in london you know the first <laughs> half of it i did get that same kind of feel you know you walk into a pub and everybody's like oh they ain't from around here that kind of stuff <laughs> um so how did how, how did this come about were you just kind of chilling one day and uh, you kind of came up with the idea or was this something you'd had kind of stored for years um well because the last film I made was a Christmas film, what mm. happened is uh, Christmas scripts started coming through the post. Um, so I was like, okay, 
pigeonhole coming my way. <laughs> um, and I've had this, te- this this sort of thing. I mean, uh, I remember going into a meeting at Creative Scotland once and uh, to make it, uh, I was talking to them about um, the short film called Sundown um, that I wanted to make, that I did actually make. Um, mm-hmm. And it's more of a sort of serious drama and they kind of turned it down and they said, can you come in and if you can give you feedback, we're well, okay, fine. Um, and they said, we didn't know why you wanted to make this because you're the rom-com guy. It's like, I've made one. <laughs> uh, you one like, sheep. <laughs> 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 um, the, the statue, you know, labeled for life. Um, uh, and I was like, so that kind of uh, that kind of stayed with me. And then when uh, the kind of the different Christmas things came in, and not, not that I'm against that, I'm very much uh, for that. Um, I just thought, okay, let's. Like, I've got to make something completely different to avoid that because I like to move around genres. And because we're quite a young company, and we're making stuff on a relatively low budget. We've got to be careful about the kind of subject matters that we choose because they need to have the best chance of actually kind of making the money back um so you know you know when you look at a lot of indie films the ones that do that do well if you want to hone your craft get your name out there and get distribution it's got to be it's got to be a horror film it's got to be a christmas movie um yeah so it was you know obviously we just had to go that way so i was just thinking about what i'm interested in and my big um i suppose trademark uh, is uh, the scottish outdoors that's a very big part of my approach. I'm very mm-hmm. keen to tell populist uh, genre stories in Scotland because uh, I don't, we don't really do it, and I think we can. And there's no reason why we shouldn't. You know, mm-hmm. we can't compete with superhero movies and that kind of stuff, but we can tell other stories in a, uh, uh, in, a in a grand way our, ourselves. So it's very much part of my mission to kind of to get to make to get these films out there. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, the outdoors, it's got to be, you know, it's, about, it's going to be about hiking, it's going to be cabin in the woods type vibe, um, because it adds so much production value to it. And Because, you know, if you do a low budget film, the, the simplest thing to do is to do, do a one room thing where you don't have to, you know, spend loads of money trying to build big sets. So if you do it outdoors, you don't have to build a set, You've, it's there mm-hmm. and it's vast. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big and it adds so much character to the to a film as well, and you can do all sorts of different types of stories in Scottish outdoors. So um, yeah, that, that that just kind of that's just where it went and where my my thought process took me. And I'm a big fan of survival films in the wild, you know. Rambo. Uh, uh, yeah, first <laughs> First Blood is a good one, uh, but you know, mm. I think even like, one of, one of my favourite films is um, I didn't mention before. It's a film called The Edge. Oh, uh, yes. I was oh yeah! Oh yeah! Before I came on, before I came on, I was thinking about that film. I was like, "This girl is like the bear in the edge." <laughs> <laughs> the bear. Hey, that that should get put up on the uh, reviews. <laughs> well, you only yeah. really like it if you're into bears. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, even you think about the edge. I mean, the edge is quite a smart film as well. As it it ticks all the boxes. It's a survival film. It's an action film. You know. it's Two guys is a creature feature, I suppose, uh, yes. but it's also got a lot of smarts behind it as well. It's got a lot mm-hmm. of um, a lot of it's got quite a lot to say about surviving in the wild. Um, so that's always been a big inspiration for me as well. I've always come back to that movie, um, and even things like um, you know, like The Grey. I think The Grey is a cracking film. Awesome. That was awesome. Um, I think <clears throat> I don't know why people it gets a bit of a bad rep, but uh, I think that's down to the marketing department because if you watch all the trailers, I remember at the time. All the trailers and all the TV spots that came on, it was it was taken with wolves uh, and um, <laughs> Liam Neeson fights the wolves. And it's like that's like one shot in the last scene of the movie. That's not what the movie's about at all. Um, got a very particular set of broken bones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean that that's a really cerebral movie. Uh, it's quite a deep movie, and I, I really kind of warmed to that that kind of level. Uh, and I wanted to try and tap into that that kind of vibe when we actually fall. So I liked the idea of starting out with, you know, a, a bunch of idiots that deserve to be killed and you play with the tropes of the slasher. And then once you kind of get out there, you get the deeper you get into the woods, the deeper you get into the psyche. Um, Cause you know, I know you've got to play by the rules, but I like to bend them a little bit. <laughs> That's it. Was there, did you take any inspiration? from the cheating wife in the edge because I don't think anyone was faithful and merciful <laughs> at all. 
Not once. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd love to say yes to that, but uh, the, uh, really bizarrely, most of these characters are based on people I knew around about that age. Um, actually, because um, one of one of the very first, the second film I ever made when I was younger was um, was a slasher movie called Greed, um, and it kind of followed the rule of the five friends and the imposter. Um, mm. But uh, you know the, the the killer was a crazy Australian, you know, with, uh, mm-hmm. with uh, me attempting a really bad Australian accent. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so I, I, but I kind of but I kind of I did think about that because I went back and watched it. I hadn't seen it for like twenty years. I went back and watched it, and I was thinking about making an, another film in that kind of vein. And I was kind of looking at it, going, "Okay, this is very amateur," but I can see what I was trying to do. I just didn't know how to achieve it. Mm-hmm. So it was almost like, okay. I'm going to pull some of these threads out and put it in. But then when it came to the characters, I kind of, I didn't nick the characters. I think I probably nicked the personalities of a lot of the people that were playing those parts because none of them were actors. They were very much, uh, they were, they were friends yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, who were, who, and, and some of them were quite good. Some of them weren't, um, but, uh, but very much they were just playing themselves to a point. So, uh, cause if you can't act, what do you do? Just be, just be yourself. Uh, it's probably the <laughs> easiest way to try and get through it. Um, and uh, yeah, I basically kind of, I just pulled bits and pieces out of who those people were. Um, I might have embellished it a little bit in Mercy Falls. <laughs> uh, I'm not, I don't think, because uh, you know, in case I'm not watching, I don't think there were any of them were nearly as awful as that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so you start with a bit of truth and a bit of reality, and then you can stretch it uh, as the story requires. It's so funny when when, uh, when we decided we were going to make this short film. It was actually Kevin kind of brought this script to me, and he's like, he "says says J Mac, he's like, there's this part in this film. I said it's a it's a lazy, <laughs> he says it's a lazy fat bastard. I think you'd be perfect for it." <laughs> I was like, thanks, man. I'll might, happily do it. <laughs> might I just say that it was uh, you did a phenomenal job <laughs> at playing Peter. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. I I, uh, I look forward to the many other jobs that are going to follow. <laughs> uh, speak, uh, speaking of which, Ryan, if if there's if there's any slots, you know, I'm oh, I'm available. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I played an awesome dead body. Um, uh, but that, that was just at the end. I was actually, like, with it blowing my own horn, I think it was all right and the rest of it. <laughs> uh, so I have <clears throat> the, I don't have a question. I did have, <laughs> he, he was, he was, like, like, he was like, hire me, hire me. Right, back to the show. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> that was absolutely Help me. fucking shameless. Shameless, shameless, <laughs> like shameless. Um, well, I, did that oh, again. I, thought, I, thought gonna, I thought you were going to say something there. Um, <laughs> you did go, you face any... you'll remind me. <laughs> Did you face any like major challenges when it came to making Mercy Falls with it being out in the woods and obviously in the film somebody falls in a beastie a stick I might add by the way I don't know how <laughs> the hell they got right the way doing that thing but like like like, like you're you're not in your your own kind of habitat you have to. We know what kind of stuff you would have had to have lugged right up to those hills. Oh. Um, did you did you face any issues that that kind of make for good stories? A daily. Um, well, you know the, the the weather it gets right in the way, um, and you know it kind of you you oh, it's it can either, it can either slow you down. I mean, it doesn't matter if it, if it's raining all day, you film in the rain, and you know it still mm-hmm. looks great. You know, everyone's wet and miserable, but tough. Um, <laughs> but what's what's real pain in the ass is when it intermittently keep, starts um, raining and then it stops and the sun comes out. Mm. I mean, there's a scene. Uh, one of my favourite scenes in Mercy Falls is the scene where Rona is standing, out comes out of the cave um, before the big fight and is looking into the into the sun with the mm-hmm. with the sunset, uh, kind of contemplating her, her fate. Um, and it, I, it was a really and it's all it's genuinely done um, at, in the the golden hour and it's all beautifully lit. It's all there for you, um, mm. and the sun's coming down and going behind those hills as it does. Um, and it's on the side of Loch T, and we're quite high up, so you can see all the way up and down the loch across and across the water. Um, mm. Absolutely beautiful. But I was just kind of we're setting up to do this scene, and down the bottom end of the loch, across the other side, there's this sort of white ball, it like the ball at the prisoner. It was just very slowly rolling towards us, and everyone's going, "What the fuck is that?" <laughs> uh, and it's like, and it's like, I don't know where's that. And it's like, I tell you what, that is it's bloody snow. 
Um, and, 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 you know, and think midway through the take, um, uh, Lauren still lit with the sun, but a blizzard starts blasting past her on camera. And it's just like, <laughs> what the hell is this? You can make it up. I mean, it was anyone who was on Lost at Christmas uh, was started laughing because they know how much of a nightmare we had chasing the snow. <laughs> um, and we don't want to know this time, but here it bloody comes. I mean, yeah, two years too late. Thank you. Um, but yeah, stuff just random stuff like that would happen. Um, and I mean, that, that location that up where that cave was um, was like in a farmer's field off a single track road, about I want to say a hundred feet high up a hill about that steep. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was tricky because the plan was to have quad bikes and take the stuff up and. Uh, initially that didn't work because uh, the path had been broken away because uh, uh, it was muddy and stuff. So you end up with situations like that where you've got to hoof all this kit all the way up to this damn cave. Um, and uh, it, it was the cave where we filmed, well, no, not we, but um, they, it was previously used in Monty Python and Holy Grail. Uh, oh, the, brilliant. The, the cave of the killer rabbit or whatever. Um, <laughs> and people come all, from all over the world to visit this thing and they leave toy little toy rabbits covered in blood and severed hands and stuff all through this cave. So we'd have to go through this thing and clear up all these severed hands and fate and you know <laughs> blood stained uh, toy rabbits. People are we weird. Eh? Very. Uh, <laughs> and it was just like I mean, we came back. We had to go and do a pickup day about a month after we finished filming, and we came back, and there was more of them. We'd cleared them all out, and the, the people had been back and left more. Um, <laughs> and it's not the easiest place to get to, so uh, yeah, just weird, random stuff. But you're getting, you've always got something coming at you every day, no matter um, mm-hmm. in some regard. And if it's outdoors, it's usually weather related. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I did remember what my question was by the way. <laughs> it was uh, obviously you were talking about filming in the outdoors and how great the locations looked. What were the logistics of being able to film in these locations? Did did you have to seek permissions all the time to get these shots? And how do you how did you go about it? Yeah, well, that's that's one of the biggest changes because I started off as a guerrilla filmmaker and you just go out with that, you know, with a DSLR and a couple of mates and you just go get it done. Mm-hmm. But um, n- but when you're dealing with a crew of that size with all the kind of expensive kit yeah and you've yeah you've got you've got to bring toilets and catering and all that with you yeah it's all uh, it's all it's all to do with insurance to be perfectly honest so Mm. you you know whoever whoever owns the land you've got to you've got you've got to uh, get permission from them and sometimes pay them or whatever um and you know whether it's a a private uh landowner who's a farmer or it's a local council or something yeah somewhere somewhere you've got to go and find whoever's responsible for the land and and speak to them, which is some, usually quite straightforward, but sometimes can be quite difficult. I mean, the the location where we did the climbing sequence, um, mm-hmm. trying to get hold of the landowner was an absolute nightmare. Um, uh, and it was just, you know, I think we got we got permission o- on a phone call, but trying to follow that up to get something in writing, and then find out can we get the key so we can actually get into the field, um, and it's just like, yeah, so. Quite often, you come across people that are not used to dealing with film crews. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, and they should not. Uh, and fair enough, fair play. They they don't always understand the urgency or the time pressure. So, um, it's uh, quite often you're trying to you've got to kind of very go, it's very gently, gently with people that don't quite understand uh, the kind of the world you're coming from, um, or they don't quite understand what you're what you're going to do. So you're trying to be mm-hmm. very very clear with them with what you intend to do on their land. Um, and sometimes um, that's all fine, and sometimes they they get a bit of a surprise when you know um, where possibly there's one too many footprints. It's got a bit it's got a bit wet and muddy, but, um, which can happen when you've got uh, an entire crew wading through a particular patch of grass for a couple of days. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's all it's, yeah yeah it's, you have to go you have to go and get all these permissions. It's just um, the nature of the beast. Yeah, uh, that sucks when you've got so many places as well. Oh, Mercy yeah. Falls, actually, like, I, I remember the first thing I thought when I was watching it is it visually looks amazing. And I imagine you use a drone for the shot, the aerial shots. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of drone filming. It's really opened up what you can do on a low budget because, you know, mm. 
before you'd have to spend thousands on on getting the helicopter out, and that's problematic mm. at best. I've never done that, fortunately. Mm. Um, but yeah, this, the drone technology has moved on so fast that you can do some really cool things with it now. Um, and you can now get relatively inexpensive drones that will get really good cameras mounted yeah. on them. So it's <clears> a lot easier to, um, you know, blend the difference between a drone camera and your main camera because you know because there's always a bit of a quality difference but it's all about kind of making sure it all it all matches it's like you know that old when you watch like old old tv series where they they go out and shoot on film out in the street and then it cuts to three inch tape in the studio and it's just a very jarring you know cut that it looks like you've just yeah. switched channels <clears throat> i get look, only fools and horses and like the old episodes of that were, were really quite bad for that but it's just the way it was and, it's, yeah, and it, yeah. I actually find it's, it's really actually quite endearing watching it now. Is it, 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 it reminds you of a simpler time. <laughs> um, <laughs> the but yeah, the drone the drone footage does it does add a lot to to how how expensive a film looks. Oh yeah. Um, I think it can be overdone. I watched a film um, a couple of months back um, with it's the one where what's his name uh, Chris Chris Evans is a bad guy. He's got a, he's got a moustache in it. Oh um, yeah. yeah. And who was the goody? Was it Ryan Gosling? Yeah, the, the, gray, the, the gray man or something. The gray man. Yeah, Aye. Yeah. Every establishing shot was a mental drone shot, and it, it just started <laughs> doing my boxing after a wee while. Um, so it can be overdone, but it was very tastefully done in yours. <laughs> so oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was very nice. Do you know, even like, I don't know, I don't know if you've done this deliberately in the film, but to me, it's like, I don't see, I've not seen that a lot since like the 90s. Having a bad guy, or in your case, a bad girl, carving up an apple with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yep, that, that's the sign of a proper baddie. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Cheating there, sport. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I came up with it, and then I had to try very hard because all I could ever see whenever uh, uh, we, we shot that uh, is uh, Christopher Lloyd in the Dennis the Menace movie. <laughs> Yep. Yes. <laughs> that's one Kevin. of our favorites, man. Yeah, that was the line I just did. Did you not get that? Uh, of course, of oh, course. That that just checking. Just checking. At the end, where he gets his hands caught in the door, he's like, <laughs> "Oh man, I love that film." Nick Castle uh, made that. Oh, uh, I know the guy that played Fine. Michael Myers made fucking Dennis. <laughs> that's true. Nick Castle. Me- Crazy, yeah. Matthew Man says, "Guessing there was no green screen in the Highlands. How high was the log scene?" <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I hate, hate to kill the illusion, but that was green screen. Um, <laughs> it was good. Uh, <laughs> it was very good. Very well, good. well, the way the reason that, the reason it works well uh, is because we did it on. We actually had a green screen put up on the location where the real location is, where the you know where the ravine is. Mm-hmm. Um, so the light all the the light and the colors all match. Um, so we had. Um, uh, Lee, my aunt, who's uh, the, the art director of the film, had uh, this fiberglass tree built, this prop built, um, that the actors could interact with and walk across. And we would mm. we placed that basically on the ground um, next to the location with a huge green screen up. Um, and we'd do all the shots um, of them interacting and crossing the tree. And then the health and safety guys would bolt it up on wires and they would place it across the ravine um so we could get the actors sort of walking up to it and stepping up onto it and coming off it etc and then when, obviously when you drop it uh so yeah it was it was a bit of a a, a mix and match of uh, some visual effects and some practical stuff but um it was all done on location so i think that's kind of why it kind of um it kind of works but um i i would love uh, yeah <laughs> i don't think we quite had the budget or the, the time more importantly, to kind of uh, get everybody in harnesses and send them out there. That's just, uh, yeah, that's, oh, that's just, that was too much. Of, that, that, that just puts the fear of God in me when you put people in those kind of positions. <laughs> They've done that in the new Scream film, um, and I was just waiting on it. It's the, was it a ladder they put between two buildings mm. and they're crawling across? <coughs> and nothing mm. satisfies me more in a horror film when somebody just goes, No! <laughs> always said that I'd go, yeah, that's the one the one we had trouble with um because you've got that scene where the 
uh, where he where obviously someone gets killed at the end of that, and they mm. fall off the, the the top of the ravine. Yeah, um, and that was a pain in the ass because the they went and hired a couple of different dummies, and they were both really inappropriate. Mm. Uh, I mean, <laughs> like blow up dolls or something. Not, not <laughs> quite, not quite. But one, one was rock solid; it didn't move. And then the other one was, um, was I think it was just like a floppy thing that had sand in it or something. Um, and it didn't, it didn't have any hands, feet, or head. And a sort of flat. It looked like a flat, like a. It looked like it, like a, like a flat football. Um, and we had them in, and I had it in the costume, and they stuck a wig on them. Um, and it was down at the devil's um, the devil's staircase uh, um, where they shoot Outlander, um, and uh, the DP, uh, you know, John Rhodes is uh, like he's seventy, so he didn't he didn't want to go down these stairs, the, these ancient stairs, and get this shot. So as I and the rest of the camp team, well, don't look at me. Uh, it's like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> so they, I, I went down and they gave me the camera. It's a big, heavy camera. It's Put on my shoulders and I'm down these really dangerous steps. Um, and they throw the, they throw the, they throw the log off and that's fine. And I said, okay, we're going to throw the dummy. I went, okay, great. Um, and I think they just did this for morale, knowing it'd never be in the cup. Um, so I'm waiting to try and make sure I don't miss it. And it comes flying down, and it's you know you know the wig comes off mid fall. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This big floppy thing gets launched <laughs> off. And obviously, everybody else has gathered around the monitors up top, and all I hear is everybody absolutely wetting themselves, <laughs> uh, sort of echoing through this gorge. Uh, it's like, oh, yeah, very funny. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so that was, we had to have a, a couple of different approaches to that. Um, we were going to do it CG, but uh, we decided that was just going to take too long. So uh, actually, uh, Carter Ferguson, our fight director, it just randomly called me up and goes, right, I've got an idea. Let's go get a hard plastic shop dummy, like the ones that stand in the windows. Um, and we'll saw off all their limbs and we'll reattach them to duct tape so it's a bit of movement. And uh, <laughs> you know, and we'll do that, we'll do what they didn't think of last time. We will super glue the shit out of the wig. <laughs> <laughs> so we get, so we put it in the costume, we uh, reattached it all with duct tape, we put we got a Michael Myers face mask and put that on them. So I had a bit of colour because oh, it's it was all white. So it, it looked like it wasn't real. And it stuck the, you know, an entire tube of super glue can went on the wig. Um, and we went back and we, and we 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 sent it down. And that worked a lot. That's the one that's in the film because uh -huh. it was solid and a bit of movement. It looked like a real body. Um, and the head sort of twats itself in a rock halfway down. So you, you get a sort of clunk. He's falling clunk and then he rotates and falls in the water. And it's like, like in Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> we all know what so, I'm talking about. <laughs> Do you know what's funny? That you, your version of that scene looks a lot better than it did in the Fugitive. I don't know if you've seen the Fugitive recently, but remember the bit where he oh, jumps yeah. out of the pipe and it, yeah. oh my fucking god! I, you can't believe that that was a fucking movie with a big enough budget to have Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones in it. That dummy mm. was horrendous. Um, See, yeah. <laughs> For a in film, defense, the, the Fugitive is is definitely in my top ten favorite films. It's that that is mm. very close to being a perfect movie. I think that shot is the only thing it, it suffers from. <laughs> there you go. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> Almost perfect. No, fucked. <laughs> well, um, see when you say the word low budget, right? Everybody always assumes it's going to be like less than, right? And when you consider a lot of the films that have been made that initially were made as low budget films that have then gone on to become like historical and iconic, right? So with Mercy Falls, like even the, the fight scene, because we like we actually, J Mac and I actually we watch some really horrendous low budget stuff that knows it's mental. <laughs> where that doll would have been the main star, right? And they would be <laughs> unapologetic about it. So we, we have a great time like watching yeah. really terrible one of, our, one of our favorites was a movie called The Killer Pinata. So that's the kind of standard we're talking yeah. about here. Uh, uh, Lamageddon is another favourite. The um, Beaster Bunny. Oh man, Ouija the Shark. Beaster Bunny. <laughs> the Beaster Bunny. <laughs> but um, with Mercy Falls, like everything in it, there was nothing there that made you go, "Oh, okay," because that's because it's low budget. Like the fight scenes were great. Even the killing. I even had it in my notes as well that the you know the the slitting of thy throat. Spoiler alert. And um, <laughs> Sorry, some of the. the 
<laughs> no, it's true. So you sound like me. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's a big story behind this one, right? But we'll get to that. Um, but a lot of the killing, a lot of the killing, like when you when you say low budget, you expect the killing to be like, oh come on, right? But it was really good in Mercy Falls. Mm-hmm. I think there was a, a good attention to to not Cheers. like. I, I think you've done a really good job at going. Nah, this will only this will only do. It needs to be this level, and you've kept it at that. Because we've watched a lot of stuff where they're like, "Ah, fuck it, this is low budget," right? And it's just bizarre. It's like <laughs> uh, it's like a marigold falling. You know what I mean? When somebody gets yeah. a hand cut off, <laughs> but you really, really have put attention to detail. And I remember watching it going, "Like this is better than it should be." When you say the word low budget, like it actually, oh, you. you don't you don't lose the film. You don't go, "Ah, there you go, I'm out." You know what I mean? Well, I was really fortunate to have a really good team around me. Um, mm. So you know Carter, the fight director, who uh, choreographed a lot of the fights. Um, you know, he's very good at kind of making sure it looks, it doesn't look staged. Um, yeah. And then you've got the the makeup team and the some makeup uh, special effects team that you know that really kind of you know you know spent a lot of time uh, trying to get get these effects to really work. And again, they, they there's not much money and there's not much time. And these things eat up the time. I mean, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I remember one scene where we had to stop and wait forty-five minutes because there had to be a, a, a wound put on someone's neck. Um, <laughs> but again, but that's the thing. You know, if you're doing these things, if you do a fight, a complicated fight where people are getting slashed and injuries and whatnot, you mm-hmm. can only go, you can only go what to the point where there's an injury. Mm-hmm. So you do a little bit and then you stop and oh that person gets slashed in the arm. Okay, stop. Mm-hmm. They go away, get the slash put on, the the wound put on. They come back and we pick it up from that bit. We do some more. Oh, you get slashed again. Stop mm-hmm. for twenty minutes. And it it's just it's a, it's a compromise. And you know that um, they have to rush through it and somehow do good work. Um, and yeah, it's tricky. I mean, um, is there'll be there's a there'll be a, there's a couple of shots where you know. Um, Lizzie, the special effects makeup uh, designer, is um, literally just off camera out of shot, uh, holding a syringe full of blood and it's pumping uh, it through. Yeah. Um, and that's a tricky thing. That doesn't always work because sometimes it will get blocked or it's on the air or whatever. Um, and you know, time is, again is never your friend. So it's it, it feels a bit more. It feels a bit collaborative and a bit guerrilla when you're doing that stuff. But when you kind of, luckily, I'm not the kind of filmmaker that is going to want to sit on excessive gore like you know like the terrifier mm-hmm. or whatnot yeah um, so um i think when you're trying to be a bit more thriller based and go for mm-hmm. the the shock value or the injury and keep the pace going um you only show as much as you need to as opposed to embellishing it i think if you were if i was to embellish a lot of that uh, with the gore, it would probably mm-hmm. fall on its arse a bit more, like like you say with other other films, because you know there just isn't the time. You have to kind of mm-hmm. make the most with uh, the time you've got and be. I have the perfect solution for that. Like mm-hmm. with them being up the hills, right? It's as simple as this, right? Ah, oh, what's up? Oh, I just got stabbed. You don't look like you've been stabbed. Oh, I've got this big Jacob on. It's freezing up here. <laughs> it's just a wee bit of blood. I have been stabbed, but I'm not going to take all this off just to show you, right? Because <laughs> re- realistically, right. If you're up there, you're freezing, so the jacket's on, right? You get stabbed about four times. You're like, oh, you're not going to be like, right here, let me unzip myself just to show you. You're just going to be like, I've been stabbed and it's there. And you sit down. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd love That's... to see somebody say that, say that after <laughs> getting stabbed. <laughs> ah, that was safe. <laughs> that would have saved me about a week. <laughs> see, something about that. Oh, and that's going to fucking hop the motor. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the ending scene um, where there's fire. I'm not going to mm. ruin it for everybody, but a certain somebody gets set on fire, right? <laughs> that was brilliant. That lo- I remember lo- looking at that as well, going, I actually have to really look closely to to see if it's not really fire. It's no. We um we had the guy on from Samurai Cop, and he actually <laughs> <laughs> he his guy was actually on fire in a film, right? And yours looks better than than his guy that was on oh, fire. Ma- mainly because the guy was supposed to be getting, um, like, he was supposed to be on fire for a certain amount of time, and then they were supposed to put him out. But the time they took it, rolling. <laughs> so he sets up during the movie, and he's like, "Fuck's happening here, mate! He's putting me out." <laughs> <laughs> have you have you ever seen Samurai Cop? Right. Uh, I have not had that pleasure yet. Uh, it, I'm gonna have to check it out now. Yeah, it not. is so. <laughs> Fucking bad that it's fantastic. It's amazing. It, it, it's the perfect, 
the perfect level of shit to be just amazing. Fantastic. Isn't that one of the DVDs in the bucket bin in Hot Fuzz when he's going through it? Um, <laughs> I hope so. I'm pretty no, sure I've no, seen the cover was, sitting somewhere. Super Cop. Meet the cop that can't be stopped. Uh, oh, yeah, totally. But I'm sure there's like one of the other ones that he doesn't pick up. I'm sure there's like mm. random ones like that in there. Oh, Samurai Cop work. is a treasure and it won't be in any <laughs> bargain bin. I can guarantee that. I think it's expensive <laughs> as hell. But that's phenomenal. And that, that guy, <laughs> the guy in the actual shots, like, what the fuck, man? I know I'm supposed to be dead, but as I say, <laughs> and you, you guys pulled that off really, really well. Um, there's that. I'm going, fuck me, man, that actually looks really good. My only one thing, right, as a, as a viewer, I kind of wish, and this isn't a spoiler to who it is that goes on fire, right, but I wish I'm the body... I'm not going to spoil like, it, but somebody got set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not the goodie. <laughs> but see, the thing is, right, um, I, I, part of me was like, because if, uh, anybody watching that, uh, that doesn't want to kind of... I'm not going to ruin it, but you can shut your ears until I put my hand back up, right? But I got to a point in this film where I went, she's going to fucking kill everybody. And then I was like, I'm happy with that. I want her to just like, right, job done. Right, job done. I'm away. <laughs> you know what I mean? I kind of wanted that. And I thought that's where it was going to go. And then that happened. And I was like, you should have known better, man. You're a trained killer. You should have known better. So that was my experience of that. And did you ever think to yourself, let's just have... Let's just have the uh, Carla proper gut and everybody and just walk off into the sunset. Because that, uh, that's more realistic, right? I mean, that's realistic. That is probably that is... more realistic, but that Aye. definitely wasn't. Uh, sadly, that was that was not in the, the thought process. Ah, uh, oh, it would be definitely <laughs> mine. Definitely mine. I think you're, you're <laughs> a bit of a sadist, though. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I've like... always said... Mm -hmm. no, no, Sorry, no. I was, was going to say, I've always felt like, and this is something J Mac and I have spoke about that that over the last 10 20 years bad guys in films tend to not really be that threatening that menacing so you don't like for me when i watch a film and the bad guy comes in and sticks a, a knife into a child's throat you're like oh you're working with some real bad shit here to the point where <laughs> I, wa I want to feel like when a bad guy walks into the room with my favorite character that i'm on the edge of my seat going no because this does never go well for anybody that's in the room with this gun and <laughs> And, and I, I do believe, and I always believe, the better the bad guy is, the more you will root for the good guy, pending that you actually really like the good guy. Oh, yeah. um, so for me, I kind of was like, well, she's kicking ass. She, like, the, the first kill where she takes, well, apart from the wee throat guy, but where she takes her climbing utensil mm. and she's just like, have some of this. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I know where we are. I know where we are, right? Let's, let's a just... utensil? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking a climbing utensil. I don't know what this thing is. I'm just going to call it a fucking utensil. I can try to clamber up the mountain with a fucking spatula. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Is it, I don't even know what you call it. But I'd imagine it's like a climbing axe or something. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Yes, a climbing axe. Yeah, a climbing axe. Aye. Aye. That, that makes that makes sense. Right? <laughs> aye, that's just, equipment. Uh, that's equipment. <laughs> equipment. <aye. laughs> so I, I very much felt also in ways that that Carla was very John Wick esque. Like just she, she didn't really get enough. She didn't really get in a fight that she she at any point did you feel like oh no she might actually get her head kicked and it was just like and it's you now. And it's you now, and I, I love that because if she's a, a, a severe threat, it should mm. be like that. And that—that's pretty much for me. I was like, I could see this going the full way, and then I was like, oh, No! Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, well, it's, it's, it's tricky when you do that because it's that you're trying to—you you know, obviously, you've got to have that final girl um, and mm. that kind of fight. Uh, so you're trying to kind of come up always um, throughout to try and. Uh, you know, make it believable and not like, mm -hmm. well, you know, how, how, you know, it's like Rambo walks into a room, you know, he's killing the guy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, so to have it turn, turn around, you know, you've got to kind of mm -hmm. build it to a point where it's believable uh, because she, you know, ultimately, you know, she does get her ass kicked in the end uh, quite, <laughs> quite brutally. But that's part of the journey with uh, Lauren's character that she kind of mm -hmm. ends up in a very sort of similar uh, mindset, you know, that sort of kind of primal mindset mm -hmm. but again it's kind of trying to wear her down so at the point where that all does happen 
you know, that her, she's not on her best game. Uh, mm. But otherwise, if she just got into the room uninjured, you know, yeah, she would have walked <laughs> off into the sunset quite easily. <laughs> so, the, just um, to just to touch on the the two, I mean, you could say those those are the two central characters. You've got Lauren Lyle and Nicolette McCoon. Um, both brilliant performances in completely different ways. Um, mm -hmm. like on an emotional level, Lauren was fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. I can't, I actually can't remember last time I seen, uh, <laughs> especially in an independent film, um, an actor that was so capable of so many different emotions and doing it convincingly. She was, she was fantastic. Um, yeah, absolutely. Have you, have you worked with her before or was this a first outing? No, no, first time. Um, it was uh, when we were casting for it. We got a casting director involved, and um, I said, "Right, we got to I've got no idea for any of these characters because, you know, um, you kind of usually an independent film you cast around you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and all my actor pals are about the same age as me, so none of them are in their mid twenties anymore. So uh, everybody's kind of... getting younger. eh? it's fucking brutal. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I had to go find all these new actors. Um, and I kind of said to the cast and I was like, okay, we've got to find someone who can handle all this emotion. And, you know, but someone who's got a bit of a recognisable face. Because um, I was quite lucky in Lost at Christmas because the, the two lead actors were relatively unknown actors. Uh, uh, but I was able to kind of plant lots of little cameos mm -hmm. uh, in smaller parts. So I was able to have people like Sylvester McCoy and Claire Grogan and Sandy of Coley kind of sort of pondering mm -hmm. about for a couple of days here and there. Yeah. Um, but this film didn't have those opportunities. So it was like, okay, what do you do? Uh, we can't have everybody uh, played by famous actors. So we've got to, we've got to try and find one that can lead it. Um, and just, you know, um, a, a list of suggestions from agents came through and her agent had suggested her for it. And it just, you know, she just stood out. I'd seen, it, I'd seen her a couple of things and I was just like, well, who's that? That's kind of interesting. Um, so she kind of just, was in the back of my mind. I never thought of her for it, sadly. Um, mm. You know, the idea was put in front of me. I was like, oh, right. Oh, yeah, I know who that is. Um, yeah. Is it she wants to do it? Really? Okay, cool. Let's let's go talk. Um, and she just on it. Um, and, you know, mm. you kind of um, I have no idea what kind of preparation she does. Um, uh, but, you know, she turns up each day and just, you know, switches it on and there you go. Um, so it was very, it, it was, um, yeah, so uh, just someone who was able to kind of go across the spectrum of all sorts of the kind of different journey um, that she has to go on because that's a that's a hard role to play. Mm -hmm. That is a lot. You could it could very easily play that over the top and a bit hammy, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's really a lot. It's really subtle and it just it just flows. And it's just like I'm kind of there going, my job's easy. It's like you don't need my help here. You you've got it. Um, yeah. Carry on as you were. I'm not saying not quite that, but but you know, but it's that kind of thing where it just like you know, you, someone just comes to work every day with their A game on, and it's like, okay, my job just got a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, yeah. which is great. But again, it, it, when some when when you get someone at that level, uh, because she's done she's done you know the reason she's at that level because one she's talented and two she's done a lot enough she's been lucky enough to do a hell of a lot of good work uh, at an early age um and uh, everybody else who's also great uh but they're all quite a lot of them are quite new and haven't have not worked nearly as much as she has and certainly not on the high profile stuff that she has so that kind of it makes everybody kind of bring up, uh, sort of come to work awake. You know, it's like okay, mm -hmm. and it, and everybody feeds off that, and it kind of moves around around the room really, and then you just end up with um, an, a good ensemble of people that are feeding off one another's energy, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it all works. If it didn't, then it would fall flat in its face, and you'd be watching one person doing really well, and everyone else kind of limping behind. But that's not the case here because mm -hmm. it was just it did, everyone just feeds off each other, and it generates ideas, uh, and then they bring you. They, they bring you just just gold and it's mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a yeah. great environment to kind of be around when you've got that kind of level of creativity kicking about and um <clears throat> obviously Nic nicolette who plays um carla or as i'm now affectionately calling her lara croft her fucking head um, <laughs> <laughs> she <laughs> again all the taglines oh. tonight eh? <laughs> uh, Nick, i hope you're watching i hope you're watching <laughs> <laughs> um she 
she was a stark reminder to stay away for the 10 out of 10s. <laughs> They're always <laughs> fucking mental. <laughs> also, she, I think she was fantastic, man. She, she she did have a really kind of threatening presence mm. um when it was time. Like you, you always I bet you were like when you start watching it, especially if you if you didn't watch the trailer. I, I actually didn't watch the trailer deliberately. Mm. I just wanted to just dive in. And I bet me was thinking she might be the kind of savior character. They're going to come across something when they go into the the wilderness, and she's going to help get them out of it. Nope. Um, <laughs> and, and when it came time for that switch, you're just like, oh, oh, you're good. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot. It's it's it, that, see, that that part is a really tricky one to play because again, it's one of those roles where it requires a certain amount of subtlety. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it becomes over the top and a bit hammy. Mm-hmm. Um, and she's incredibly good at um, uh, bringing that subtlety to it. And it's, you know, it is definitely it's something that we talked about a lot about. It's that kind of, you know, if you think about like Robin Williams and uh, like One Hour Four or even Insomnia, mm-hmm. it's again, it's really underplayed. And that's mm-hmm. what makes it creepy. But yeah, again, yeah. it's that mixed with the physicality because it's a very f- uh, physical role. I wouldn't yeah. say she has a huge amount of dialogue in it, um, but um, so the, the it, is, it is a very, very um, physical orientated role because um, yeah. there's so much that she. I mean, and she threw herself into absolutely all of it. I mean, I mean, she was cut and uh, bruised all the way through it, um, just by you know just hell for leather. I mean, she was. It turns just, out she was uh, just for the makeup nights. artist. <laughs> you're, make a you're not needed today. She's fucked anyway. <laughs> Speaking of that, what was it like going into that water? Was it freezing? I, oh, you'd have to ask her. I didn't go in. <laughs> I mean, because that was my first thought. I was like, at that time of night, like water like that is freezing as it is, but see at night time, something about the night, it just, it's a wee oh, bit more cold. Um, I th- it was pretty cold. Um, I mean, <laughs> I think it's one of those things, isn't it? You know, you, um, you know, you kind of put your foot in and it's freezing, but you threw yourself in, you kind of adapt, I suppose. I'm sure. Yeah, I suppose. Like that. I have no right to even make that assumption. <laughs> um, but uh, and I, I feel really, I felt really bad for them because it was vet, it was really wet that night. It was really windy, and you know, that, that just makes it even colder. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've got to hang about and wait for us to have cameras in position and all that kind of stuff. Mm. But then it's. And, it take, and, and, you, and then you've got to get them out because you can't leave them in there for too long. But they don't really want to come out because if they come out, they have to get they have to dry and warm up again and then go through it. That's that's another matter of hell. Mm-hmm. And you've got to go back through it again. You want to do it and get it done, mm-hmm. and then that's it. You don't have to kind of <laughs> so I just fucking hit the court. <laughs> <laughs> but I know they were. I mean, they were great. The both of them that ever went in the water were real trippers about it, um, and just didn't moan. It was all very well. Uh, it was heavily rehearsed and uh, coordinated and talked about, and you know, no one went in there before. You know, everybody knew exactly what everybody had to do. Mm-hmm. So it was, there was no none of that, none of that uh, creative faff. Do you know what's kind of funny? We um, when we made our short film, we got in touch with an actress uh, who plays Carol, and her name in real life is also Carol. And we sat down and we were like, okay, and, and, and just so you know, we're not one of these people that be like, yeah, there are no shower scenes. And then, padam, there's a shower scene out of nowhere, right? And then <laughs> weeks later, we phoned her and we're like, Carol, see how we said there would be no shower scenes? <laughs> there's a shower scene. <laughs> right, but, but we played it in a way that, so she wasn't and she wasn't naked or anything, but she had come out of the shower, um, mm. which basically was her. She was clothed under the towel, but it was the illusion that she'd just come out of the towel. How do you approach those conversations where you go like, well, we've got a scene here and you're basically going to be stealing this girl's boyfriend in the water at night. How do you approach that? Or is it just in this, you just go, here's the script and you just assume that they've read that and accepted that? Well, no, no, the way you have, I mean, it's the, with, with any kind of uh, tricky, you know, sense of scene, whether it's, um, it's got any kind of sexuality to it or it's got nudity mm-hmm. or a stunt, even stunts or even just say uh, water. Uh, I find the best way to be is just to be really upfront and make sure everybody knows exactly what you're trying to say with a scene, mm. because I think it's very easy to misread something, oh, and or make assumptions about how they're going to shoot a scene. So there might be there might be a 
a scene where someone gets out of the shower or someone or there's a, there's a scene where some people are having sex or whatnot and you know the assumption will be made that it'll be it'll be done through the shadows and you won't see it you know that so i think when whenever there's anything like that you've got to be very upfront and just say exactly what what you're trying to say with the scene and, uh, and the nate and the tone of the scene uh, mm -hmm. and why and you know have a justification for why you want to shoot a certain level of nudity for example um which is something i've kind of actively avoided because you know i didn't want to have the conversation um, <laughs> uh, and, and, and so, but, uh, but again you, you mature as a person so you're not you're not afraid to have those conversations and yeah. i've been in that situation where i've not had the appropriate conversation to the right level and you've ended up compromising the scene or the tone mm. of the film and you're always kind of kicking yourself with how could i improve on that and mm -hmm. but nowadays where it's it's made it's made a lot easier for everyone including the actors because with the introduction of the intimacy coordinator mm. uh, and about we, we brought on uh the lady who actually invented the role um and she was great and very sort of upfront and um and i remember the first time i had a call with her uh and i thought because you'd read about these things in the press with all the Me Too stuff, and, you're, mm -hmm. you're, and the impression I got was they were there to kind of uh, question you and go, now, would you like to tell me why you think it's appropriate <laughs> to have this you know, you've seen in the script? What do you think you're playing yeah. at? That's what I thought was going to happen. But it was the complete opposite. It was a full-on creative conversation. It's like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. I see what you're doing. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, don't you think you could push this a bit further? <laughs> uh, uh, I, oh, and, and it was really just being honest about the tone of what you're trying to do and that was really refreshing mm. so we would have these conversations and although I'd had the conversation with the actors uh, beforehand she would then go off and talk to them all individually as well, make sure everybody's comfortable and happy to do what's been laid out because you know, there can be that pressure where an actor won't want to don't won't want to piss off a director and fear that they might be mm -hmm. cast, or, which you know, which is not me at all. But and it's that kind of thing where you know, there's that kind of added peer pressure um, between an actor and a director sometimes on stuff like mm -hmm. this, and I feel it just as bad as well. Um, so it's great to have this person who's completely neutral, who's there to basically look after everyone and service the scene. Really, mm -hmm. um, so it's like it was a great um, way to do it. So. Everybody was, you know, the actors were had had almost rehearsed the scene, uh, <clears throat> based on my conversations with the industry coordinator and what was in the script, um, and then I would be brought into the room and they'd show me what they'd worked out, and then we'd we'd, we'd move it around. But it mm -hmm. was a great way to work because the awkwardness had gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know those kind of scenes, whether it's theatre, um, whatever, even even just, I mean, I when I was an actor, having to do like a sort of you know kissing scenes and whatnot they're always fraught with everybody thinks that kind of stuff's quite romantic and kind of kind of fun mm -hmm. to do it's an absolute nightmare i've done um, it on stage plays um, before <laughs> yeah yeah well I remember, I remember um i remember doing this film um where um me uh myself and my, my co-star had uh, had to have this snog um and it was a it was a pickup day because i hadn't gone the, the shots hadn't gone well and when we shot the main scene so we came we did a pickup and the director was ill the day that we shot this so she kind of said right you're gonna have to do it i went oh great thanks very much um and we kind of set up to do this thing we, we were good pals so it was it was fine but the camera operator who was new uh didn't really register with uh, the awkwardness of the tension in the room mm -hmm. and just went uh, okay, so we'll uh, we'll just let's just go for it, and I won't record this rehearsal and go. And we just kind of both looked at it and went, "Fucking, we'll record it." <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, it's, like, it's just kind of it's you know, it's not it's 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 all very it's all very technical, and you know, you kind of you 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 know you're trying you do it to hit the lights, and because I remember shooting scenes like that with that you know when I was directing some of my earlier films, and you'd shoot a scene with two actors have to have a kiss, and it, it's it's very e easy to actually see bugger all because there's masking going on, and suddenly there's a back of someone's head getting in the way of mm -hmm. seeing the other person's face, and it's, you know all that kind of stuff you got to figure. So it's, it's a very technical 
coordinated kind of dance mm-hmm. routine almost these things um and you just have to kind of treat it that way um because you want to kind of you don't you want to get through it as, as easily as possible without anyone feeling uncomfortable and make sure you get in the can what you set out to get in the first place mm-hmm. so it's um, i mean i could talk all day about it but um it was i would uh, beforehand i was terrified but by the end of it it was it was um, a very creative process and the awkwardness had gone and you know mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great thing i think you've done it well as well like i'm always, yeah. i always say i mean like as as teenagers like some of these scenes and films that we've seen were were class but mm. i think where storytelling is sometimes there's no need for too much so right. even suggestion works but sometimes like what you achieved in that scene was very mm. much perfect it was like the right amount of cake i don't know if it was cake <laughs> you know what i mean it was, I it was you, yeah was a bit tone and I'm, i i i hate that i mean like, even looking at like, when we're talking about the 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 gore effects and the violence it's about several it's about being true to the tone and not being mm-hmm. gratuitous yes. um or 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 the opposite not not being um not up in the ante enough to the tone that you're trying to set so mm-hmm. it's 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 about a fine balance um and luckily, everybody understood the tone of of these scenes, and you know, and and performed accordingly. So, um, I mean, even that scene in the cabin, uh, where Rona and Scott were they kind of get it on uh, at the end, mm. uh, so you know, everybody that's, that's, switched, eh? Oh yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> the all switched really, partner. <laughs> yeah, but that's a really sinister scene. Uh, mm-hmm. If you kind of, you know, the way the camera moves and the way that Rona behaves in the scene. Uh, is very much like a, an animal sort of preying on a on a victim, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and even with the way the music is, um, it you know I, I, I know that the first time I saw I heard the score for that, uh, Stephen the composer thought it was funny to throw in some seventies uh, black exploitation track, um, <laughs> the, uh, and it was just like it's like mm, you wasted time writing that, did you? Thanks, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but you know, but if you listen to this. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the score in that is quite sinister. There's nothing romantic or kind of bal chicka wow wow going on there. It's a it's mm-hmm. a very dark. It's playing it's playing to the primal um, mm-hmm. instincts of the scene. Um, which again, that's kind of interesting to play, and that's kind of um, again that's servicing the tone correctly as opposed to being having a the quote unquote uh, they stop knowing as a killer out there and have uh, a gratuitous sex scene for no reason than why the fuck not um, <laughs> know. Which, uh, which which some people do misinterpret it's kind of interesting um uh when some people that uh, maybe aren't quite ready to take on board uh accept more cerebral ideas in a, in a slasher film tend to miss some of these bits uh and they just poke fun at it uh and i try my best not to just reply to them on twitter and goes it's not my fault you're stupid <laughs> I've even I've even stopped saying that to folk because I'm just like <laughs> I go to write a response and I go, Ken, what? Yeah, <laughs> no, you're not getting this from me. You know what I mean? That's a very hard thing to do, isn't it? I mean, I've got a lot better at it. When my fr- when my last film came out, I was I was I was I was ready to declare war and you know burn down the the, the, the Scotsman headquarters. You know that oh, that kind no. of. Uh, <laughs> I was Mate, ready for you know what? Carnage. See, see that one? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's um, when you when you start operating at this kind of at that kind of level where you've got the ability to get a PR company involved and you stick your head above the parapet and out it goes to all the all the reviewers. That's uh, mm. that's terrifying. That is, mm. you really question your own ability, and you, you kind of start to doubt what the hell have I made um, mm. when. <laughs> Because it, it's 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 fraught with, uh, and I had to I told all the actors in this because they were all relatively new. I said, "Listen, do not go looking for the reviews. Uh, there will be, there's going to be good ones, there's going to be okay ones, there's going to be bad ones, and there's going to be downright offensive ones. It's just the nature of the beast. It's going to happen. It doesn't matter if it's the best film ever made or not. It's like these things always happen. It's just how it goes. Because you know, ultimately, depending on where they're coming from, they have an agenda." Uh, in some regards, so you I just don't gotta... people know. Like exactly. these are people that don't even know how to spell camera, let alone know how to make a film or understand what goes into making a film. So yeah, and 
everyone's got an opinion, you know, and mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's like, what, what's the expression that um, opinions are like arsehole if everyone's got one? And um, they all stink. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, but yeah, some people, everyone's got a job to do. It's just part of the, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, the Guardian have ripped both of my films apart. Um, and it's very kind of, it's a sort of highbrow looking down the nose, you know, they've, you know, they've not obviously pissed off, they've been made to watch an indie mm-hmm. low budget film. It's that, you know, that kind of thing you gotta watch out for. But you take it with a pinch of salt. The first time it happens to you, it's it's like salt in the wind. It's quite a nasty thing to go through, but you Can learn you? that it doesn't matter. Um, and you kind of, so the second time around, I've been a lot easier uh, just taking them on board and kind of, mm. I mean, uh, what there was a, I shouldn't really talk about them, but there was a, there was a, a quote in the Guardian review and you know that this guy came up with this line months ago and he's just been waiting for an excuse to use it. <laughs> uh, and what was it he said? I mean, it's completely untrue. And he, uh, he said, at least Nicolette McEwen had the good grace to kill them all off in, in ascending order of acting ability. And it was like, <laughs> fuck you. Um, uh, and I was like, you're really tough for yourself. You've been sitting on that. You, you just, uh, and it was like, it's a good line. But it's fast. It, but um, I mean, one of the actors turned around and said, he, it's like, you kidding? I'm getting t shirts made. Uh, and it's like, I thought, yeah. what a good idea. So, the, the, actually, a bunch of us got the t shirts made. And it's like a, it's like a t shirt with uh, one of the group shots of all of them. Uh, and it says, we, we all died, quote unquote, in order of acting ability. Um, That's brilliant. <laughs> and, That's you, know, brilliant. And, you know, put one in the post to the guy that wrote it. Uh, <laughs> but just, but again, it was just the kind of, and it was a, it was a good way of breaking the ice um, because some people were initially taken a bit back by it. And it was like, mm. and it was just to go, is like these things don't matter. It's not true. Oh. It's just, uh, it's just this will happen. This is never not going to happen to you. So get used mm. to it. Um, and it is, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a bastard of a thing to kind of take on board. You've made something, and then you put it out there, and then you know. Some people yeah. are going to like it. Some people aren't. You know, and that's just that's just the way it goes. I would say you should never take criticism from someone you would never take advice from. You know, um, people came into the cinema recently <laughs> to watch Mercy Falls. It was an older couple, and they came in, and afterwards they came out. They said that's been getting some harsh reviews. Which, by the way, I've not read because I tend not to read reviews. I make my own mind up. But I thought it was really good. <laughs> and those, for me, the best way is I, I watch what the the people I speak to everybody when I'm in the mm. cinema. I speak to everybody that come in, regardless whether it's a big high-end budget, a blockbuster, especially if it's an independent film. And I'll always say to them, you know, how was that? Do you enjoy it? Um, and I've had nothing but positive reviews from Mercy Falls. No one's That's ever, no one's walked out of it. And by the way, people have walked out of blockbusters. I've seen people get up and go, Ish. right? So, That's what I'm, I'm, I'll, I like to sit in the back of a uh, back of the cinema when I go to one of one films and then kind of just try uh-huh. to watch for people how people are reacting and whatnot you know chase them out get... what are you fucking leaving for <laughs> i know that's the thing someone gets up and goes you think where the fuck are you going well, i'm going for a pish that fucking shit back then <laughs> so i'm <laughs> coming with you make sure you come back i know you, you time them and you watch yeah. them do you make sure they come back in Usually so, so that was that was a jobby like, like he went for a jobby <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, but yeah, it's, it's like you're kind of you're just watching to see. What, I mean, um, what was it that happened? Um, oh, I had a story in my head there, and it's gone. Oh, oh I know what before. that's like. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh you bastard! It's gone. It happens. I remember it really, but yeah, oh, it, was oh, like, no. it was a critic story, but it's gone. Ah, oh, that was it. That was it. That was it. Uh, on yeah, so last of Christmas it was a cracker. Um, so um, the uh, the Scotsman film critic is a particularly hard. He's called Alistair Hartness, and he, I think he's got the nickname Alistair Harshness. Um, <laughs> and he hates Harshness. He hates Scottish independent film, right? You, you, if you look, if you look up any film, any review that he's given to an independent Scottish film in the last five ten years, he'll, he'll it's basically a copy paste job, and he calls every mm-hmm. single film, every one of the directors, amateurish. I think he stopped short of calling Danny Boyle one, but he slagged off Train Spot and Two, but he came very close to it. But anyway, um, uh, Natalie Clark, who was the lead in Lost at Christmas, so, uh, was doing an interview for the Scotsman magazine. And they gave it a really cool spread, like the front page of the cover on the Saturday, and it was like a four page spread, and uh, it was focusing all about her in, the, in this film. 
and, and it was a great write-up. Um, and she'd previously worked on a film with uh, Timothy Spall. And the journalist asked her, so what was he to, like to work with for? Because uh, she'd interviewed him for um, a film called The Last Bus. And uh, she had she kind of get pulled up for this guy's harsh review of his film. And he can because he, he turned the spot arrived and he goes, I was nearly not fucking coming. And I thought, why is that? Because you gave me a really shit review. Um <laughs> and and he made her read out the review during the interview. <laughs> which I thought was crap classic. Uh, right. and this put this poor woman it was 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 mortified. And then Natalie, uh, who's got a very dry wit without missing a beat, went, Well, you gave us a shit review too. Um <laughs> And she was mortified, and she read, and she looked at it, and was like, and she was really apologetic on on their behalf to the point where, when the article came out, she kind of gave little bits of review, her own review in the article, and said, "Thank you, I'll take that quote." But it was almost like an apology. Uh, so it was almost like, "Yeah, we know he's a bit of a dick, but you know, what do you do?" Um, so it was just, I thought it was interesting that he kind of uh, that uh, that always stuck with me, and it's like, "Yeah, you're right. It's just it's going to happen. It doesn't matter because." It gets the word out there, and people disagree and agree, and it makes people go mm. see. Oh, I wonder if it will be that bad, and then it's not. Mm. So that's all. That's always good. But I, again, last time really got under my skin, uh, and this time it's like meh, meh. The thing, the thing is, I mean, the, the Scotsman, I think, is the most ironically named newspaper on the fucking planet, <laughs> right? All that's happened there is their critic has seen the word Scottish next to independent and went no, can <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, mm, uh, it's just my thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll draw a sweet veil uh, over that political line. <laughs> we we we're, we're ready to. I mean, we've submitted our short film to like twenty nine different festivals, so we're we, we're ready. Our arses are out, ready for the. <laughs> So we've uh, yet to experience. That. I've already got the Vaseline on mine. Like, <laughs> um, ours was our short film was actually written by BAFTA Award winner John Rooney, um, okay. brilliant, phenomenal writer. Um, so I'm like, well, we made his film. So if they're like, here, this is shit, we're like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm nice. prepared for it. <laughs> Just, yeah. I'm sure you'll be fine, but yeah, it's just one of those I, things, isn't it? Um, ah, of course, you just got to kind of. What, we can, what are you doing? What are you doing next? What's your plan? What, what would you like to do? Um, I would really. Um, I've I, there's a couple of things I'd really like to do. Um, because because I moved into the horror, I'm I kind of I'm interested to do another one in that kind of vein, but I'm also quite happy. Uh, at the same time, quite happily go back and doing another Christmas rom com because in the in the in the time that we've been making Mercy Falls, we've seen the last film do pretty well. Um, so I kind of I'd be keen to kind of revisit that genre or try something completely new. Uh, I was right. I've been writing a, a sort of kidnap thriller um, set in the Highlands, a sort of more slightly more Hitchcockian kind of thriller, mm -hmm. which I kind of like the idea of maybe tackling next. Um, also, during COVID, I developed a TV series, like a crime series, um, which has mm. been shopped around. I don't know if that's going to come off anytime soon, but you know, um, I'm open. I like I like to move around genres. I like to do different things. I mean, um, mm. I've got half an idea for like a like a proper sort of message on a bottle type kind of romantic drama um, mm -hmm. that I'd like to have a go at. Um, just just because you know, you tap into different little themes when you do a film when you cover different different um range of emotions and things kind of sort of hit you and you go oh right that worked that little that little vein of that kind of subgenre worked really well here i'd like to kind of focus on something full on but um ultimately whoever's going to pay me <laughs> uh you know, share with uh, the money yeah yeah pretty much um well, again, it's 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 finding that balance between your creative aspirations and figuring out how to make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of that's that's the hard balance you've got uh, that uh, you need to figure out um, because it does take up so much of your time. Uh, I mean, I used to uh, work lots of. Well, I used to be a postman at one point, or worked in mm -hmm. a restaurant where you're trying to juggle this, and it's it's impossible because. It takes up so much of your your brain power that you can't give it to something else. Um, mm -hmm. And the amount of time it takes to kind of build a career and even like build a production company, it's you know, that's taking years. 
to kind of get us to this point. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that that's the balance. So yeah, but I think that's partly the the, the part of the the approach to you know it's always um, the very populist genres that I'm interested in. So. Um, they're the ones that kind of people want to see. They're more likely to get commissioned. So hmm. we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, uh, it's frustrating fun. when you feel like you feel like you have to kind of pander a wee bit, you know, just to to kind of make something that you think will get picked up instead of something you really want to make. You know, I mean, do you find that? Do you find that <coughs> frustrating? Um, yes, but um, um, I've not really encountered it that way. I've encountered it once. There's a particular film that I want to make. Um, called Journey Bound, which I spent years trying to get off the grounds and kept failing. Um, and it was like a, you know, a, a Scottish road movie, like a road comedy. It's like planes, trains, and automobiles in Scotland to a point. Um, <laughs> and I was really passionate, and I'm still really passionate about getting that film made. And we had everybody involved in it. I mean, uh, I mean, Ford Keenan was one of the producers. Uh, basically, the entire cast of Lost at Christmas were, that were involved. That's how they ended up Lost at Christmas, because they'd signed on to do this Johnny Brown film. Uh, mm. Rod Gahar was going to be in it before he died. And that, that kind of, you know, so it was like everyone was lined up to do it. I just couldn't pull the money together to do it. It was uh, my biggest failing, but it's kind of, that's probably the biggest disappointment. It's like, they're just like, this this would work. Uh, um, this I knew, I know people would, would flock to that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, when you just can't quite bring it to life, it's, uh, it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Yet, everything's all about timing. Exactly. Always, I've I've learned that. Matthewman says, "Love the poster art for the film. Kind of reminds me of Scottish screen movie. I think that's the knife." Also, <laughs> yeah. Says, well, uh, funnily uh -huh. enough, um, the poster is designed by the same designer that designs the screen movie posters. Uh, that's Matthewman, the designer who pretty much has an eye for that, right? Yeah, yeah. Could, no, you, could you could you bring up any Matthewman stuff? Just, just uh, well, a, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I, I like that one, few... Matthewman. That, that's a he good a comment. Quit. If you he want says, a good Rotten Tomatoes score these days, you just need to buy it. <laughs> um, he also goes on to say a Scottish rom com Christmas horror movie sounds good, and that's <laughs> Stab C. Nisbet. <laughs> <laughs> I will that's kill you. Yes. <laughs> Ma Matthewman is an underutilized treasure. <laughs> um, you, you will see that. I'm just going to go and try and pull up some of his stuff. Obviously, you know, obviously, that I am. Um, run the cinema mm. and what happens a lot is Matthew Man will disguise my face <laughs> in a lot of the big blockbuster films to the point where you see how I was a uh, I've got a, a running a running uh, relationship with the newspaper. I always send them the ones that Matthew Man like puts my face into <laughs> and they'll publish it. Sometimes I've been uh, quite successful and sometimes I get the email back saying, "Nice try." Um, I've, I've <laughs> got a top up here. So we were we ha we had a previous guest on Craig Fairbrass. Do you know the actor? Oh, um, and uh, we were chatting, and I think someone got confused with the Fairbrass being right. Said Fred and Matthewman made this. It's Rise of the Fred Soldier, Vengeance. He's too sexy for your pish. <laughs> <laughs> he also, you can see the nun at Bathgate Cinema with uh, my face. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Lizzo, oh, um, the Meg too with my face in it. There's me as part of the the crew of um. There's That's my favourite. As the little mermaid. <laughs> there was actually a wee girl. A wee girl came in and was like, that my picture is displayed in the cinema for the licensing uh license that we have for the alcohol. And she pointed at the picture of my face and went, "That's the guy for the poster." Um, there's J, J Mac and me. <laughs> oh, you guys get too much time uh, in your hands. <laughs> oh no! To be fair, I think he puts time time aside for this. And this was one of my favorite ones. This was my favorite. <laughs> look, look at the bottom right. <laughs> they were like, "Nah, well, there's no way we're posting that." Um, and they they done their own one essentially, but it's. Uh, Matthewman is pretty much uh he's a he's an untapped talent that should be in the industry making proper films. And he has, and there's some coming up which you guys will be able to see. I was hoping is... you'd bring up Dick Dynamite. That's a Beltary poster. Which one? The, the main Dick Dynamite poster. Oh the like the actual one. Aye, um, aye. Are, are you are you aware of Dick Dynamite? Um I am uh, and I haven't been able to see it yet. I saw the trailer and I was like, I need to see this. And I yeah, aye. I kept missing it. 
Brilliant. So I, um, need, I need to get to see it somehow. Uh, well, a good friend of ours, Robbie, made it. Um, I can't actually find the actual poster for it. But Matthew Man made that. and I mean, Mar Matthew Man pretty much done all the artwork for that. Um, and that, oh. that went down. It's proper, like, B-movie, but it's like Duke Nukem the movie. Like, proper <laughs> mental. Um, Matthew Man had this <laughs> for the... Uh, for the Barbie week, <laughs> and then there was the Indiana Indeed. Jones week as well, and now he's he's phenomenal. But I, I can actually, I could probably get you a screener for Dick Dynamite, but you're probably better seeing it in the cinema. Um, totally. And they're just back yeah, in I, New I, York, so I think I saw next that. time yeah, he's yeah. Uh, so next time he's doing a, a, an event, which I think is Kirkcaldy very Kirk soon. Kirkcaldy is doing one in Kirkcaldy soon. You should yep. come along. Oh, I'm um, I'm going to Kirkcaldy as well quite ah, soon. Ah, nice. So I'm actually oh, doing yeah. a wee bit of work on Dick Dynamite too. Um, I've actually already okay. secured a few actors for the, nice. um, the sequel. One being the guy from Samurai Cop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, and, and J Mac. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so there's quite a, a, a chunky cast of like proper, really good, like Michael Ironside guys like that. It'll be pretty oh, epic. Amazing. Uh, amazing. So, uh, so keep your eye on, on what, what's going on with that because um, it'll be pretty cool and we'll need to keep our eyes on exactly what's going on with yourself because I really enjoyed Mercy Falls and I think mm -hmm. if the next one is as good as last Lost at Christmas I'll need to see um, I'll need to see that at Christmas time I went to watch, I know it's on the BBC iPlayer went mm -hmm. to watch it and went nah I'm not going to because I want <laughs> Halloween's next. It's a bit soon. It's a bit soon. Uh, like, I want to feel the magic. I want to feel the magic. <laughs> there are certain films. There are certain films that that you can watch any time of the year. Certain Christmas films, but I think if you're going to experience a new Christmas film, it has to be at the right time of year. Um, so oh, we should do another episode in the future, but close totally. to Christmas, talking about lots of Christmas. Also, if I could recommend anyone to do music for a Christmas film for you, G. Tom Mack, the same guy that wrote Cry Little Sister for Lost Boys, he's wrote songs for Kiss. Good friend of ours, he wrote a song two, three years ago called What Is My Christmas? And it's actually the most Christmassy song that I've ever heard since like Christmas songs actually were a thing. You know, most Christmas songs now is just like Sam Smith standing there with a, well, <laughs> used to be, used to be that he'd be standing there with careful, a song careful, singing careful, about Christmas. Careful, redacted, um, redacted. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like Christmas songs. I think the Darkness were the last group to make a Christmas song that sounded like Christmas. Everything else no. generally just mentions Christmas since then. G. Tom Mac successfully made me go, that song's Christmas. Like that yeah. song's actually Christmas. Um, <laughs> it's got fucking and think, bells in it and everything. So oh it's man, it's just uh, <laughs> I, I mean, we um, we stuck. Uh, we did a bit of anti Christmas uh, music in our in Lost at Christmas. There's a song in there uh, that, uh, that basically has the line, um, "It's Christmas time and all your heroes are dead." Uh, is how it opens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Rudolph getting mistaken for a drone and gets shot out of the air. Uh, oh, I, I, I was just like, I love the irreverence of it. I said, okay, we're going to do something that's not quite as Hallmark -y, so it's a great way to open the movie. Oh, that's um, close. <laughs> you can catch so, yeah, the Dynamite uh, Saturday, the 7th of October at HB Fest in Paisley. I thought it was Kakodi. This is, okay. he's actually okay, here, the, the writer director, Steed. He's in the comments. Um, so I um, need to get nice one. one. Dick Dynamite needs to be experienced in a cinema. <laughs> It's just totally such good fun, yeah, man. Definitely, definitely. But it's been amazing having you on, Ryan. You're welcome on any time. We do a lot of watch alongs as well, where we, you know, like we were mentioning that we watch, we watch some crazy shit that's like super low budget, but we do it live with the audience, like this. Except for <laughs> we watch and they watch, and and believe it or not, they stick, they stick with us the whole night, commenting along with the same thing. Um, so you're pardon me, you're more than welcome to come along. We we laugh at it. But we still appreciate it because oh, yeah. work had to go into being like you know what I mean. Some some of these are really good filmmakers just deliberately making some fucked up shit, and that yeah, yeah totally. shit has a place in my heart. So <laughs> so I keep it, I keep it, and we uh, and we very much enjoy that. And um, so Mercy Falls is out Bathgate Cinema. Uh, I'm going to give it as long a run as I can. Um, appreciate it. Where else you can see it now in uh, Sunny World? Am I right? Uh, no, it's just finished its run in Cineworld. I had um, had a couple of weeks there. Um, uh, it was at Odeon as well for a night. And it's currently, let's see, so it's in Bathgate. It's currently mm -hmm. at the Tower in Helmsborough. It's uh, playing in Oban. It's playing in Fort William. It's playing in 
Where's the other one? Uh, Eden Court and Inverness, and then it's going to the Adam Smith and Kirkcaldy at the end of the month um, as part of their reopening. Um, I think they've just refurbished that place and it's about to be reopened. Ah, so, Beans um, needs to come along to that, actually. The Dick yeah, Dynamite totally. director. Ah, yeah, right. so I'm, I'm going along to that. I've, I've got to go and do a Q&A uh, at the end of the month at, um, in Kirkcaldy. So... Uh, Oh, that'll be fun, but yeah, it's uh, it's 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 out, it's available, and then if you miss it, it'll be coming to digital in early November. And where's that? Will that be Amazon? Um, oh, no, I think it'll be uh, Tubi. Oh, that's in America. Uh, the Tubi, right. um, it's a it's a Tubi original in America, and that came out mm. in May, um, which was a really cool deal. Came out of nowhere, and it's like, okay, we've got this great deal for you, but you need to finish the film in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so that that was a fun couple of weeks uh, of cramming six weeks work into two, but um, <laughs> we we did it uh, all in the in the in the name of money. Uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> aye, but it will be coming out here uh, in the UK and Ireland um, on all the usual platforms um, mm. to begin with uh, at the start of November. Physical release, Blu-ray, Steelbook. No plans yet. I would love to see a, DVD, a Blu-ray, a DVD. Um, I think there's going to be a DVD and a Blu-ray release in Germany. Mm. Uh, the Germans still love their physical media, so Last of Christmas got a nice little DVD and Blu-ray uh, release, nice. and they always end up as available in Amazon anyway, so uh, it, w- it will it will definitely become available. Yeah, I'm a fan, I'm a fan of physical media. I mean, uh, I don't know if you can... Well, there's a whole, whole bunch of them here. There's a whole bookshelf in the next room. Uh, I've actually, I've actually got a laser disc collection. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. In fact, if I've moved, if I move my head slightly this way, you can see both of them. <laughs> collection. <laughs> um, so I went to start yeah. a collection, and my wife chinned me for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's his collection. Um, I have a few friends actually that that are very well linked with some really good companies. They, they even make VHSs, like new oh. releases on VHSs. So if you're ever looking to do that, I can connect you with a few good people that, that basically do it. And that's US and UK, which is pretty awesome. cool. But, but we are very yeah, much it's... fans of physical media. Yeah, yeah totally. And I, it's, it's a shame that it doesn't happen nearly as much because you end up with um, distributors tend not to pick up physical release rights uh, when they buy a film off you um, just because uh, it's it's risk more, mm-hmm. more than anything else and it's uh, they see it as a dying media like they always see like indie films won't get a sim release and then you have to push and prove them wrong uh, but again it's just the, the conformities of uh, the way the industry is and you know that everything's about content on streaming um, so it's um, it's risk averse I suppose um, mm-hmm. so I get it but yeah I'd, I'd, I'd those that love physical media are always going to love it. You know, what I mean, we're mm-hmm. always going to buy the blue, the Blu-rays, the DVDs, um, the four, uh, the four Ks. I haven't bought any four K ones yet. I'm kind of, I'm I've got both, a few, uh... but I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, do I really want to go down this hole? Because it happened from all my DVDs. I'm starting to collect, and only mm. now my favourites on Blu-ray. But then I'm like, well, what are my absolute favourites for four K? But when I start the four K, I'm going to go. Well, if I've got this one, I need all of them, and I'm just going to be skint. So. But let's not have that conversation now. But we'll, I'll stick to definitely Blu-ray. But I've got a few 4Ks. <laughs> yeah. kind of well, the pro- I mean, I love old films. Um, and the problem is, if you start going into 4K, you're going to start seeing mistakes and things that you don't want to see that are going to ruin it for you. So, you, uh, oh, what's that? Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think kind of Blu-ray is a good level. It's get rid of the kind of that sort of that shitty washed out DVD feel, um, and, uh, and it kind of that's the way you. It's probably the closest you get if you go and watch it in a cinema. I mean, most most cinemas are two K anyway, which is only just a fraction above that's HD true. anyway. Um, I so that, I feel that. that's the the best way to the most honest I, way to see it. I mm. genuinely thought they were all at least four K now. Is that wrong? Hell no, boy. Fuck. No, it's like the, um, I mean, I think some of them you do get it. Like you get your seventy mil like for Oppenheimer and things like that. But um, no standard. Mm-hmm. The standard request is DCP files at two K. Because thirty-five millimeter film is what feature films were always shot on. That's mm-hmm. uh, r- roughly about two K resolution in digital terms. Um, so, right, yeah, right. I don't see the need to go well beyond it. Nah, especially if there's no need for it. Eh? Robbie Steedson says, "Yeah, what date?" So this is the director writer of Dick Dynamite. So it looks like he's going to come and see Mercy Falls and Kirkcaldy. And you two should have a, a chat. I think you could totally hit me up. Benefit, uh, benefit each I other. I think it's. I want to say 29th of this month. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. 
so so far away. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's uh, the last weekend of the month. It's on either the Friday or the Saturday night. Um, in the Aaron Smith, I can't remember what night. Um, it's probably I think it's on the website, but um, mm. I should probably check to make sure I turn up on the right night. That'd be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will. Me- I will message him. Uh, Mattyman says definitely a shortage of Scottish horror movies. Looking forward to seeing what you do next. You should actually do the sequel to uh, Dog Soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no no! Never never touch a, a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, one film that I love uh, that was a big inspiration for this was The Descent. But my God, have you seen the second one? Uh, I couldn't see the first one, man. It was dark as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is that's the thing. You do you do you make a low budget film and you make a great amount of atmosphere by not having by making it quite dark and not very um, huge amounts of lights. But what do you do if it's a success? You throw more money and you add more lights, and suddenly it's not scary. Yeah, um, it's funny that. It, yeah, weird, but um, yeah, I love the descent. The descent is a, is, a, is, a, is a cracking film, but yeah, I, um, who wants the responsibility of making a sequel to a classic? No, thanks. <laughs> nah. you, you, you tend to find that the only decent sequels are directed by the people that made the first ones, and even that's quite rare, right? Um, like Kevin Terminator 1 and 2, both awesome. Terminator 3, piece of shit. Piece of, I, no, I no, don't no. say until the end of my life. Terminator 3 is not. It's not it's not on par with one and two, but it's not a piece of shit. I disagree. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. It's it's one of those things where you make some I mean, let's face it, T two is one of the greatest films ever made. Probably the uh, te- technical excellence is unmatched, right? And you know, you're never gonna uh, you know, I think what I like about Terminator Three is that the director, uh, John Moss, is obviously just gonna look at it and go, I can't even make a film better than that. So I'm not gonna right. try, I'm just gonna do my own thing. Um which I think is possibly the same grace of that film. Just accept it's not going to be T2. It's mm. just carrying it on. This um, did not go the yeah. way I fucking hoped. Anyway. <laughs> uh, no, I, just, I, I cannot forgive it for having the Terminator in a fucking stripper suit for the entire film. I, I, cannot, <laughs> I can't get over that. It's Talk just, to the hand. <laughs> Talk to the hand. Uh, it's, come on. Fuck. Early two thousands part was so shit. <laughs> yeah. I think we can agree though. It does have a great ending. That ending where there's, like just, there's nothing to be done, you know, the world mm-hmm. is coming to an end. Uh, I uh, love yep. that, just leaving them in the bunker. It's like it's a great way to do it. it all, and That's almost like as well, it's like happen. Yeah, it's like a, you kind of you know we will meet again. The, the, we have an episode coming <laughs> very soon in a couple of weeks. <laughs> the deep dive of the <laughs> again, made by Matthew Man, of course. Um, but this this episode, because J Mac and I, for our five year podcast history, right, have argued at length about this film, right. I am all for it. <laughs> J Mac absolutely hates it, right. And finally, we're getting down to brass tacks in a couple of weeks. Oh. Quite a few episodes already Bro. in the pipework. <laughs> it's going to come to a head. It's J Mac and I, and we're going to we're going to hash this out once and for all. And I'm going to revert back to this conversation. Like even Ryan thought you were talking shit. <laughs> right? Now I'm I like some right really bag. bad films. So don't 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 don't, don't, don't put it on me. Uh, <laughs> Matthew says you're probably name some of them. <laughs> uh, well, we probably like the same ones. Problem with T three was you never got, you're never going to beat the T one thousand as a villain. Well, that's true, even if she is like. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Christina Loken. <laughs> right. Anyway, we are t- we went way off on a tangent. You make films as well, mate. Thanks for it. <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, yeah, I had a had a blast watching Mercy Falls. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I hope you can Cheers. please dive into horror again. I know you said you, you want to, but please make sure you do it and uh, keep it keep it up. Keep up the yeah. the standard. Oh, by the way, that was another question I was going to ask just before we go. What was the budget? I'm so nosy when it comes to budget. He asks everybody this. He puts everybody on the spot. You done it. You done it to beans or not? Right. And he was okay, like, I'll like tell it. it was 200 grand. What? Right. Like that's that's quite good compared to, like for a for a low budget 200 grand's actually quite good. We know people that have made phenomenal beans for far less and made such really good stuff. So that was actually really good. As soon as you mentioned oh, toilets geez. and catering, I was like, that's at least 200 <laughs> <laughs> no, like, Yeah, yeah. Up a hell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, just... <laughs> <laughs> what, what, where are we thinking? You know, Dragging a shit up a hell, though. 
Yeah, there's a fucking I'll horse in it, for Christ's sake. That's gonna, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah, we we pulled that one with paper round money. Yeah. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, so you, you can tell by looking at it that it's, it's not it's not a it's not a what's the, what's the word ultra low or mega low budget. It's it's low budget, but it's. I would say as that, far as Scottish, Scottish cinema goes, it's probably that's mid, good. Got, it's a mid-range yeah. budget for a Scottish film. Um, yeah, it's but, not too, it's not too bad. Yeah, I mean, but again, it's just because um, you're dealing when you do when you want to get something to a certain level, you can't be reliant on favors. It's literally you've got, you've got to have people out for you've got to pay them for their time. So it's just uh, it's kind of it's making the most of what you got. I mean. Ultimately, uh, if we, you know, uh, everyone did do it on a on a, a much more reduced rate than they would normally be used to if they're working on bigger productions um, on telly or whatnot. But you know, but again, a film like that, if we if we had the, the amount of time we needed, that would just that that budget would have doubled quite quickly, mm-hmm. and it can run away from you, and you have to kind of watch that. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that, we just, know what that feels like also. Yeah, uh, but it's just that's oh, cost yeah, two grand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but I mean, I've been there. But uh, and it's just, it's amazing what you can do. You never have enough time or enough money, no matter what level you're working at. Mm-hmm. And it's the ingenuity and the creativity that comes out of working with what you've got and who you've got around you. Uh, that, that and you can come up with, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It, it's just um, you just got to get creative uh, and make the most of what you can do in the time you've got. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, if if someone said to you in hindsight. What budget would have been perfect for Mercy Falls? Would you have said two hundred k, or would you have gone for something a bit higher? I'd probably have doubled it, because um, uh-huh. there's there's lots of things that we didn't have that we could have really benefited from, um, and just uh, yeah, had we kind of if we looked at it now and and seen the way that what we had to bring to it, and then what we could have done if we expanded it further. But again, hindsight is a is a beautiful thing. Not much help, but it's a bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to watching stab scenes, but um, that's, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, classic. I'll, I'll, I'll rock up and watch that one as well. <laughs> we should actually make it just a wee mock one, um, but that'll be class. So brilliant, and that stake the forward. high road. There you go. There's Stake another one. The high road. <laughs> uh, Beast enders. <laughs> <laughs> that's no Scottish. That's no Scottish. Do you work for oh, the Scots? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Beast enders, bloody hell! Ah, no, he's come full circle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, thanks very much for coming on. Like I say, you're welcome on any time, and if you ever need us for anything, uh, we have great premises and stuff. I got a full mood movie studio and all that stuff. You need to come and check out. Actually, you were in the Absolutely. cinema recently, but you never got the full grand tour of the place. Um, so I'll be happy to to give you that. And um, I we're like I say we. are we do our best to support local and independent filmmakers. That's essentially what we aspire to be. Uh, and a lot of our friends do the exact same thing. And it's filled with heart and passion. So how can you not love something like that? And I think as well, even if there was like shitey bits in any film that's independent, you can forgive it. You know what I mean? You can totally. you can forgive knowing... Like, you can't even forgive a blockbuster, if there's shit, which, which most of them are. I think it's substance. <laughs> the substance is shite. Mm. Like the, the visual effects are amazing. The substance is shite. On the other way around, it's like the, the independent films, the heart and the substance is there. Just sometimes it's like that wasn't real, that was CGI. You know what I mean? Like obviously. Yeah, totally. uh, so we, we feel that. So thank you again for coming on. And uh next time you're doing something, we'll get you on. And we should also do Lost at Christmas when it comes to Christmas time. I'll even wear a Santa hat. J Mac will dress up as Santa. Brilliant. I'm there. <laughs> But no, no, I really I'll, I'll dress up as Mrs. Santa Claus if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, man. Uh, Brilliant. But no, no, um, thanks for it... having us on. It's been great. And everything you guys Pleasure. do uh, with this and sport and film and you know, run the cinema, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a great thing. And uh, yeah, keep at it. Anything I can do to help, you. let me know. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, is there anything, is there any place you would like to divert our traffic here? Um, I, I, I've got a way with words. I know that. Um, any <laughs> websites, social media? You can catch of all Ryan's work. The bra- you can catch the Brain Master at www.magicmonkeyfilm.co.uk, <laughs> where you can find all the stuff that uh, he does there. Make sure you go ahead and support. You can get tickets to this film if you're local here at bathgatecinema.co.uk. Also, if you rewind this episode, Ryan told you where all the other places are: Kirkcaldy, um, Fort William, a few other places. Auburn. Watch. Auburn. Inverness. And Inverness, we actually done that fairly well. I thought we'd forget all the places. Um, 
Italy. Italy. No, I'm joking. It's all in Italian. It's all running. <laughs> I mean, if, you ever need, if you ever need to film in the rain, always go to Oban. Every time mm. I've been to Oban, fucking raining. No, <laughs> it's just one of these places. Still beautiful, but it's always raining. Nah, totally. So uh, make sh- make sure you guys go ahead and follow all of Ryan's projects and do your best to support. And if you can make it to a cinema in a wee while, it's going to be everywhere on streaming platforms. And we'll do our best to share that so everybody can see Mercy Falls. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us tonight. And we will see you guys next week with a RoboDoc interview with Chris Griffiths and Gary Smart, the guys behind the magic. Need to sort you out with a screener for that, Ryan phenomenal piece but we shall see you guys next week thanks again and thanks again ryan you're welcome cheers all the best bye guys <laughs>